welcome everybody. Uh, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Dr. Deirdre Pickerel and I'm the Dean of Student Success at York University and the Toronto Film School. And on behalf of the Student Success team, I am very pleased to welcome you to today's Ask an Expert session. As we begin, we acknowledge that the land York University operates on in British Columbia, which is where I'm located, is the traditional unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples of the Kakite and Kwikwetlam First Nations. We do this to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility in improving relationships between nations and to improving our own understanding of local Indigenous peoples and their cultures. Today's session I'm really excited about. Um, we are kicking off our activities related to Canada Career Month. For those of you that didn't know, November is Canada Career Month. It's a time when we encourage a national conversation on ways to improve access to career services and supports and to ensure all Canadians are better prepared to grow and develop their careers within a rapidly changing labour market. Given tomorrow is also Remembrance Day, a time when we honor the sacrifices of the many who have fallen in the service of their country. And to acknowledge the courage of those who still serve, we thought it timely to celebrate military careers during and after service. So to do this, I am deeply honored to be joined today by an amazing group of people. To begin, I'd like to introduce Paula Wishakurama, who is a certified career development professional, a leader in the Canadian career development sector, and she has a history of working as a career transition coordinator supporting military members in the process of retiring or releasing from the Canadian forces. We've also got Martin Spriggs, who served 15 years as an, inf an infantryman and paratrooper in the Canadian Army and is currently a video production student at the Toronto Film School. Sherman Neal is also here, who's a 38-year veteran of the Canadian Armed Forces and is a writing for film and TV student at TFS. And lastly, Karen Stevenson, who is a Yorkville um, employee. Karen is the Director of Learning Experience Design. And she grew up in a military family that goes back four generations. Karen is also a military spouse, and she's currently supporting her husband as he transitions into civilian life after 18 years of service. So this is an amazing group of people that we have brought together. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. I'm absolutely thrilled. I will monitor the chat. So to all of our attendees, please don't hesitate to use the chat or to use the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. But I will, um, so I will be doing that. Other than that, I, I'm gonna shush. I'm gonna turn it over to Paula, who is our moderator. And so Paula, over to you. Thank you so much, Deirdre. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. I'm thrilled to meet the other panelists. I'm super excited to get to chat with you today and to hear more about your stories and to shed some light for the folks that are attending the session today on career development and what that means for individuals who are making that transition from, you know, what oftentimes people don't understand what a career in the military looks like, um, or the contributions and the skills and the experiences that you bring with you to the civilian workforce when you leave. So I'm just really thrilled to be able to hear your stories and, and looking forward to chatting with you for the next hour or so. Um, it's been a real honor for me to be able to support and serve those who have served um, in terms of being able to help identify transferable skills, prepare for the civilian world of work, make that transition. And I know that those of you that are taking programs in school, that's all like it's I'm super excited to hear about the programs that you're taking. It sounds like a lot of fun. Your eyes just lit up when Deirdre mentioned what you were taking. Uh, so that's a good sign that you've chosen something that you're passionate about and interested in, which is awesome. Uh, so, you know, certainly the um, making that transition can be can be challenging. It can be very exciting. And uh, there's lots of lots of moving parts. So I'd love to hear just briefly from each of you about your transition experience um, and what that was like when you kind of bridged the gap from the military to what next. Um, we know that this may, may or may not be your final destination in your career, but certainly this next step that you've currently embarked on. Martin, did you want to go ahead and tell us just a little bit about your about your transition? Sure. So um, I left the forces in uh, 1996. Um, I, I actually broke my back in a in a parachuting accident, so it, it, it kind of forced my hand. Um, I'd served 15 years. Now the the army was really good, and they they offered me to hide me somewhere so that I could do 20 years. But I kind of promised myself as a young man that I didn't want to be one of those grumpy old, you know, sergeants, you know, bitter. Um, so I took a voluntary release waiting 
for the medical career board to set. Um, it, it was uh, a little scary at first coming from the combat arms. There's not a lot of, uh, uh, of jobs that, cro that cross over. And I think soldiers and you know military members don't realize the skills that they have, right? So they think that they're you know pigeonholed, especially from the combat arms, they make good policemen or security or blah, blah, blah. But so I had just come out of Gulf War one and also, you know, Bosnia. I had I had done combat first aid. So I went to school to be a paramedic. Um, there wasn't the the support that there is now back then. So this is 96. There was no programs. I think they offered like five hundred dollars uh, towards education and that was it you know thanks for coming out blah 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 so um they have a wonderful program now uh um and it's just fantastic and it's geared towards educating ex you know service members and i i i wonder sometimes you know i've i've lived a, a full life but i wonder where i would be now if that was open to me back then so um the biggest thing for me, I, I, I guess the biggest change or a couple things coming out of like military. Uh, and again, I was combat arms, so we're a lot different than the trades, right? Um, but coming out of the combat arms, you didn't have a sergeant major to make sure that you had the courses that you required to advance your career. Um, it was kind of the opposite, you know, in the civilian world, everybody's against you and, and, and they don't want you to be promoted. And so that was adjustment number one. Adjustment number two was kind of the attitude, again, coming from the combat arms, it's accompl accomplish the mission. And so the civilian world doesn't really have that you know if if the if the clock goes at four o'clock everybody's out the door it's like what do you mean we haven't completed the mission we we have to stay and complete the mission so that was number two and i i guess the biggest one for me was number three is that the camaraderie wasn't there you know um uh, i retired a sergeant so we were in the sergeants and the warrants off in the warrant officers mess on Friday nights, if we weren't, you know, deployed, and, and, and that was gone. There was no, you know, there were there there was no camaraderie. Um, so those were the three big things for me. Awesome! Thank you so much for sharing. There's lots of points there. I think we'll pick up on a little bit later. I'd love to be able to hear Sherman's uh, transition story. Let's see if it parallels or is different. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, my, mine's a little different. Um, I retired after 38 years service. Uh, 35 is usually the maximum. Uh, they asked me to stay beyond the 38 to complete a strategic level project in Ottawa, uh, which I did. <clears throat> and then they asked me to come back as a public servant. So my transition story doesn't have uh, the challenges that Martin's had, obviously. Uh, basically, one day I was in uniform, the next day I was wearing civilian attire, uh, but I have to echo his, his sentiment about loss of the camaraderie. Uh, now, mind you, I've elected to work from home uh, on, a, on a pretty much a full-time basis for, for the policy work that I, I do. So that gives me some flexibi flexibility and freedom to spend time with family, which I didn't get to do, and my daughters uh, will attest to this. Uh, for 38 years while they were growing up. I was deployed, uh, I was in Yugoslavia, Gulf War I, uh, Afghanistan. So all of these deployments, these exercises, the lifestyle of the military was great. I, I mean, I was a kid in a candy store. Um, when I transitioned, now being a public servant, I'm still within the department. So I still have that connection, but I no longer have my rank, which is how we in, in the military identify ourselves. So that's a bit of a challenge. But 
for the most part, it, it's been great. And now with the program that Veterans Affairs has set up uh, and the money that they make available, I was actually able to make a dream come true, which is to be a part of the Toronto Film School and study uh, writing for TV and, and film. So yeah, basically that's my story. Very cool. And is that a big departure or are there transferable pieces from the work that you did in the military to what you're studying right now? Oh, there there are a ton of uh, relatable and and um, skill sets that that transition easily. I mean, I, I'm mentoring a young young man right now in uh, who's earlier in the program, you know. And I told him the big thing is is organization, and I'm sure that all the panelists can can agree that they drill that into your head. You got to be organized. You got to know what the mission is, like Martin had said, and you have to know how to accomplish it. And you have to have plan A, plan B, plan C, and know what second and third order of effects are. So that one piece alone is, is really critical to my success so far in, in the program. Very cool. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that story. Karen, I'd love to hear from you now, just get a bit of your kind of, you know, your take on all of this coming, come from a military family and being a military spouse and what that transition has looked like for you as someone who's on the supporting side of it. Yeah, um, first of all, thank you, Martin and Sherman for your service. Um, it is a lot different on the supporting side, but I see so many parallels when Martin was talking. I was like, this is what my husband's dealing with right now as well. So he was an infantry soldier for um, 18 years, just transitioning about three or four months now, um, medically released. So uh, that means he now does have the flexibility to take a couple years to figure out, you know, what he wants to do going forward. Um, but yeah, he's missing a lot of what Martin mentioned, the camaraderie. Um, he, with being an infantry soldier, he feels like he's lacking any sort of transitional skills into any, you know, uh, employment that he would feel is, is, worthy of leaving his you know current situation with the medical release so yeah you know i had to work very closely with him with his resume and because again he said something very similar i don't have any skills to put on my resume and i filled up about three pages very quickly so you know um it's just all about breaking it down and you know rewording and stuff like that but yeah it, it's a bit of a struggle and again as both sherman and martin said i'm used to him being gone all the time so um him being home all day <laughs> and me working from home all day is also a bit of a, a adjustment um but yeah you know you have to be careful not to fall into the you know uh maybe he you could take on just just being the cleaner of the house you know <laughs> so uh you know we're working together to deal with a lot of that but it is a transition it's a major transition yeah for sure but i'm very proud of of how well he's doing with it for sure Thanks so much for sharing that, Karen. Yeah. It, it was always really interesting when I was chatting with people in my second career assistance network coordinator job about, you know, the transition and, you know, people would talk about, you know, it was always the jobs and the skills and the school and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And I would always ask, so like, how's your family taking it? Well, that was like, then that became the focus of the, <laughs> of the conversation. Cause I mean, that stuff is just as much, a part of the transition and the you know sometimes the challenge of the transition as as the career stuff and having supportive spouses and family members and communities really helps um you know to make that all that much easier to manage and deal with because it's a lot it's you know it's a lot to think about you're going from something that you've known and done for 15 18 38 years to something different and you know not necessarily knowing what that's going to look like not having a rank to identify with anymore, not, you know, people not being able to look at the, you know, your cap badge and know exactly what you do every day. Um, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty and ambiguity, which can make things really challenging. So I appreciate you shining some light on those things. That's been super, super helpful. Um, I'm really curious to hear from everybody as to what some of the best and worst career advice that you got along the way was. Uh, I mean, everybody's got something to say about your career transition and what you should do and what you shouldn't do and you know how to get this and how to get that. 
Martin, you had mentioned how, you know, I wonder what it would have been like if we would have had these services and supports all those many years ago. And in 10 or 15 years, you know, probably you'll be saying the same thing. Oh man, if we'd had this 15 years ago, wouldn't that have been awesome? Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit about kind of that best and worst career advice, what you've implemented and what you haven't, what's been helpful and what hasn't. Um, we'll start with Sherman, we'll start with you for this one. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll, I'll start with the worst one. And um, it's, it's a bit of a story. Um, I was serving in Germany at the end of the Cold War in 1992. And immediately following my tour, I went to Yugoslavia uh, with Roto Zero and did Operation Harmony with the United Nations. And then I was posted back to Canada. And basically, my family moved. Uh, and I, all I did was show up. We got to North Bay, uh, hadn't seen a career manager in, in four years. So the career managers came to, to the base for a visit. I signed up for an interview, walked in, uh, introduced myself, and the career manager looked at me and said, yeah, I, said, I looked at your file. You're not promoted. You just got posted here, and there's no career courses for you. So I don't know why you're wasting my time, at which point I thanked him and, and left. And all that to say is don't believe everything you hear. Because within 12 months, I was promoted to sergeant, I was posted out of the geographical area, and I was given my advanced training course. Uh, and, and it was just, it was one of those things, you know, basically at the very moment that I walked in that office, they had no plan. Within 12 months, that completely changed. And, that, and that's the nature of, of the military. You know, um, hurry up and wait is one of our, our long-standing mottos that uh, we live by. Uh, the best career advice I, I got, um, I worked uh, with the Canadian Forces Chief uh, on the Chief's Council, uh, advising the uh, general officers of the Canadian Forces. Um, and the best career advice that I got was my last job in the military, which was they asked me to modernize the NCM Corps, uh, the leadership capabilities of the NCM Corps, to develop a new occupation for our most senior non-commissioned members. So uh, I had to make a decision and, and my wife and I talked about it. I had reached my 35 years. I was ready to retire. I didn't know what I was gonna do. And to be honest, if I had transitioned at that point, um, who knows what I would have been doing uh, really because I wasn't, I wasn't ready for it, even though I knew it was coming. Um, and so we agreed, I stayed an extra three years. I did the project, uh, long story short, uh, it was successful, it's been adopted, and now is being implemented throughout the force. But in that three years, it allowed me to build a reputation within the strategic development community that when I did decide that it was time to leave, they actually came to me and said, hey, we've got a job for you. You know, So that's why I said my transition may, it is not normal. I basically, one day was in uniform, Next day, I was in civilian attire doing a similar uh, uh, strategic development job. Thank you very much. That, the worst career advice. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Don't ever let anybody tell you what's going to happen or not going to happen, because inevitably things will change 14 times between then and, and the time something actually yeah. comes to be, right? Um, and what you had talked about, you know, with that time to develop those relationships and to build those skills and to build those networks and build those bridges. I mean, so often that is how people find their next, their new, their different when it comes to their career, right? I mean, you can have a real solid plan. I'm going to go to school. I'm going to get this degree diploma certificate. I'm going to go and work at this company. I'm going to be there for 10 years and then I'm going to retire things don't always work out that way. Um, but it, you know, it's those relationships and opportunities that you find yourself um, building and developing over time that often result in opportunities that you didn't even know were possible. Right? That's Very awesome. true, yeah. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that. That's fantastic. Welcome. Martin, <laughs> best and worst career advice? Well, I'm kind of funny because I, I don't recall ever getting any, you know? Um, I think one thing that ex-military people are really good at, though, is, uh, you know, setting goals and achieving them. So when I left the military, I, I was very goal oriented. I wanted to be a paramedic. Um, 
And it's funny because when I was doing my EMT training, um, I was going to SATE. Part of that was that you did, I don't know, there were like 12 shifts in the ER. And I got into the ER and, and I saw what an ER nurse could do. And I went, ooh, that's cool. And uh, I, when, as soon as I graduated from EMT, I applied, I applied to nursing college and boom. I, so I, I, I went a whole different, uh, a, a whole, a, a whole different direction. Um, I think military people are so good at attaining goals. Give, give an old soldier a goal and man, it's like chucking a bone to a dog. They'll go and get that and, and they'll grab it and, and they'll chew it and, and they'll make a statue from it, you know? Um, and I, I didn't get any advice, but I'd sure love to give some. So um, when I left the military, I, I would say to, to, to every ex-service person that's out there, you know, listening, I, I would say you have huge school, uh, huge skills. And to uh, echo Karen's husband, same thing. I thought I had no skills. I, I was a crack shot. I, I could, I, I was good in the field, good in, in the bush. I was a good leader, but I didn't think I had anything transferable into the civilian world. But man, was I ever wrong. Um, as part of my career as an RN, I worked, I worked emergency management for Alberta Health Services, and, and I was running exercises, and I would write up like an, an exercise op order in the same way that the Army would do, and the civilian leadership just loved it. They said, oh, this is fantastic, and I'm thinking, this is nothing. A good master corporal could do this, you know, but it, I, I mean, it's it's so it's so funny looking back. So I would say, ex-serving members, uh, don't ever think that you don't have skills because you do. The training that you have is fantastic. Most of us went through you know leadership uh, courses, and and they're invaluable. I mean, invaluable in, in the civilian world. A lot of jobs get higher or you get promoted by, you know, seniority, but in the military, you had to pass courses and, and you were peer rated. And, and, and so if you came out in any leadership position, whatever it was, junior NCO, senior NCO officer, you've got leadership skills there, you can lead. And, and that's so invaluable too. And then the third part is, I would like to echo you, Paula, and say, um, one of the biggest learnings that I had about the civilian world is that relationships are everything. And, and, and of course, coming from the army, I, I, I can't speak to everybody, everybody's experience out there, but relationships were, they were pretty low on the priority list, right? <laughs> but in the civilian world, you have to build relationships with uh, employees, fellow employees with bosses, with contractors, with, uh, you know, subordinates, you know, superiors, whoever. And, 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 and that's something that I didn't learn until I was like 45 years old, you know. Um, but uh, I, I, I would really love to press upon the point that ex-service men and women don't underestimate what you have because you got a lot and just go for it. Great points, fabulous points. It was always so interesting to me, you know, somebody would come in and they're like, okay, where's the list of jobs? So this is what I am in the military. Where's the list of jobs that I can do on Civvy Street? There's a list? They're like, yeah, like you must have a list. Don't you have a list? You just like pick from the five things that a combat engineer can do? Oh, sweetie, it don't work that way. <laughs> Yeah, but what's what's really interesting though is 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 that uh, especially the, uh, those that are are you know medically released right now they have something called the Canadian Forces Vocational Rehab Program and and you go through testing and you 
and you sit down with a shrink and you go fill the dots in the circles and they they show you what you're good at i i, I mean again this was not available to us way back then but it certainly helps people that are stuck and they and they're not sure what to do there's resources out there to help you helps to see that there are options right um and i think so often i mean one of the messages that i heard consistently from people is i've always just done what my career manager told me to do this was the next step for me unless i changed occupations unless I commissioned and less and less and less, you know, did this, this was how my career was going to progress. And so sometimes being able to see those options, you had talked Martin about, you know, being in the ER as a paramedic and seeing an ER nurse working and going, Oh, I could do that. Right. That looks really cool. Sometimes it's that exposure to other opportunities and options that you don't even know exist or that might be a possibility for you for you know pick any one of a handful of reasons um you know so sometimes just getting out there and getting outside of that 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 bubble that you're used to being in and and noticing things around you and talking to the people you talked about relationships sherman you had brought that up too you know paying attention to the different jobs that people are doing and the kind of work that they're doing the projects that they're involved in and the kinds of environments that they work in um, to start to broaden those horizons. Some of my very favorite conversations with people were, tell me about something that you did that you're super proud of. You know, they say, I don't have any skills. I'm like, okay, well, clearly I'm not going to get a list out of you at this point. Tell me about something that you did that you're really proud of. And they'd start talking and I would start writing. And usually in the span of an interview question response, you know, tell me about your greatest accomplishment. Um, I'd have a list of 20 different skills that were easily transferable to like 15 different easily identifiable for me occupations or jobs that they could do that they had never even considered. Um, so sometimes it just takes somebody, you know, asking that one question or being able to reframe what they've done in language that would make sense to a civilian employer you know, those kinds of things. So I really appreciate you sharing, um, sharing your advice on those topics. That's great. Karen, how about for you? Like in terms of career advice, I'm sure you've heard all sorts of things from your husband about, you know, what he's been told is possible or not possible. Um, what are some of the, yeah. the good, the bad and the ugly things that you've heard? <laughs> Yeah, so um, like I said, he did get medically released recently. So we are part of this new um, option, which is absolutely amazing. They're very well taken care of. And, um, you know, I noticed in the chat, a lot of you with us today have served and are also releasing medically and that sort of thing. Thank you all for your service. Um, and yeah, I mean, we thought for my husband, the best solution was he releases and then we get, he finds a job right away. Um, so, you know, he did think about doing the commissioners and that sort of thing. And I think some good advice he got from the gentleman that interviewed him was, why don't you take the time? Like you are given this time. So take that time and look into what you really want to do. My husband's young. So, you know, he could have a whole nother career yet. So take the time you know, go back to school. This is your time now to have a career that you want. You know, it wasn't so much. Um, I think with the military, it's not that they don't want to be in that career because they, they often do, but it becomes so engulfing that they kind of forget what they fell in love with to begin with. And I think now this uh, uh, provides him with that opportunity to kind of take a step back and say, what is it now that I want to spend the, like, the rest of my working career doing? Um, and this amount of money that they provide uh, for education is just amazing. It's absolutely amazing. The sky's the limit, basically. So, uh, you know, and we have two great examples with us today on how they're following their passion, which is exactly what I'm trying to convey to my husband right now as well, because what an opportunity. I'm pretty sure the rest of us on the panel <laughs> maybe would take that opportunity as well, um, you know, but or, or maybe we're already doing what we're passionate about, right? So now it's it's my husband's turn to do what he's passionate about, is definitely. I think I have to speak to your husband, Karen. He's in the other room right now. <laughs> <laughs> Bring him in. 
<laughs> I'll hook you up, Martin. I'll hook you up. <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, and this is exactly, I think, the kind of thing that makes such a difference, right? Being able to talk to people and hear those stories and experiences from people that have been there, done that, that have gone through you know, some challenges and some successes and that can talk about both of those. Cause it's not always really like done and easy and, you know, perfect on the other side, there's often bumps and ruts along the way. And, you know, being able to hear from somebody that those can be overcome and that there are resources and tools and supports and things that you can do to make that a little bit smoother. Right. So it's a very, very kind and generous offer, Martin. Very good. So um, yeah, it's always, I always love hearing from people about their career advice that they've received along the way. Um, knowing that you have had access to services and supports along the way, and I know that you know the career services that are available to folks that are transitioning from the military are a little bit different than what's available to kind of the general public um, in terms of, of transition support. What um, what has been the most helpful for you in terms of career transition support? Was it a person, a service, money? Like, talk to me a little bit, talk to the guests that are with us today a little bit about what has been the most helpful and helped to really propel you forward in that career transition. Who wants to go first? I can just talk a little bit about um, what was available. So um, there's a tremendous amount of support uh, while you're still in. Um, after the release, that drops a considerable amount, but there is, you know, there's JPSU and the Transition Center and that sort of thing. Um, I don't think they really focused much on helping my husband find employment outside of uh, the armed forces. I think it was more just with the medical release and assisting with that sort of thing. Um, however, I, I do think the support's there if you're, if you're looking for it, for sure. And would um, you encourage, oh, sorry, Karen, I think I cut you off there. Go no, ahead. that's fine. I just like, I'm very involved and not everybody has, you know, a significant other that is that involved. Um, so maybe that was one of the reasons why, you know, Ryan didn't feel like he had to go get that advice because he knew that he, like we would be working together to accomplish this. Um, but that does not mean that that support isn't there. So um, just from our experience, definitely jump in right away to those those options and get as much out of it as you can prior to leaving, um, especially if you're not medically releasing. I don't know what happens at that point, uh, but I do know for a medical release, um, you know, you still have your case manager and that sort of thing. So um, I say grab onto as much support as you can, for sure. If I can add, add to that, Karen. Um, so when I transitioned, um, I, I wasn't medically released, but I had injuries uh, that Veterans Affairs has taken care of. What I would, would, what I would recommend to you is that if your husband hasn't already, is to contact Veterans Affairs, get his file started, because there are transition services on the other side of the release aspect. So as an example, even though, even though my transition job-wise went from one day in uniform to being a public servant, um, I did go through their transition services. Uh, they helped me to uh, craft my resume, which you had said you've been helping your husband do. I had an amazing uh, career counselor, I guess, for lack of a better term, uh, by the name of Joanne, who was absolutely wonderful to help me. And when I got into places that were um, a little dark, uh, she checked up on me, which, which was really cool. And that goes back to what Martin had said, you know, because you're right, you know, once you leave the force, the camaraderie in the civilian world isn't the same. It's something totally different. Um, and I can remember not reaching out to her for, for a substantial period of time. And she came back and she sent me an email and said, hey, you know, is there anything I can help you with? Uh, so that really helped me. It also introduced me to the education piece, which your husband is perfect, is, is eligible for and is absolutely ama amazing. Um, and I highly recommend that he, if he finds his passion, that uh, my discussions with VAC and going through the process, uh, mind you, 
let's keep the the bureaucracy of the of the whole thing separate because it's <laughs> filling out forms. Uh, but um, once I figured it out, it's really easy. So I mean, at the end of every term, I have to submit my marks. Uh, plus a, a form saying that I've re-enrolled for the next term and VAC sends me the money PDQ. So I would definitely, like I say, have him reach out to VAC, uh, not only for the education piece, but for the transition services piece. Definitely. Yeah, we'll definitely look into that. I know he's with his case man, like he's still in contact with his case manager quite often and he's doing the uh, um, occupational um, program that they have to do as well. So it's probably part of that, uh, you yeah. know, down the road, but, um, yeah, for sure. I will definitely, that's really good advice. And I think the part that he's struggling with is the unknown, right? When you're in the military, it's very predictable. You know, you know what your responsibility is, you know, what job you have to do now it's the, what am I going to do now? You know what I mean? Like, what what is it I want to do now? So that's where we're at currently. And, you know, my advice is to him is to go on to, you know, these institutions, these academic institutions and look at what programs are offered. Um, you know, even hop on some of the job banks and look at what jobs are, are being offered, you know, as just suggestions, you know, because I said you are, are taken care of for a few years, but your schooling could take a few years, right? So we want to start it as soon as possible if that's something you want to do so so yeah so i'll definitely tell him about that though thank you very much for that yeah there's also i mean if he if he's looking for employment there are organizations out there such as canada company uh that sort of thing that specialize uh in helping veterans find employment um and and i've it's been a, a year or so since i've looked at their website but they had job postings all over the country yeah, I did find that one. And also, um, when you retire from the military, you get a special code for the federal jobs because mm -hmm. you are, you know, you're in line near the top for those as well. So we're just waiting for that to happen too. So okay. yeah, lots of options. Just got to weed through everything to figure out what it is exactly he wants to do. So, <laughs> but yeah, that's great. Good. Awesome. Great. Thanks so much. Both of you really appreciate that dialogue back and forth was great. Uh, awesome to have those conversations. Um, Martin, for you, you had talked about, you know, like the access to the services. What what was the most important or the most beneficial piece um, for you when it came to your transition? What piece could you have not moved forward without? Uh, that's a difficult question to answer because I transitioned 20 some years ago, right? So uh, I don't think I was a typical case that could be compared to the cases now because we lacked the services that are available now. Um, uh, I'm not going to echo uh, both, you know, Sherman and, you know, Karen, because their points are very valid. Um, but I, I, I think, I think the, the key well, the key to my success, the key, the key to my success post, you know, military has been education. Um, I, I'm the most educated dumb guy that you'll ever meet. I mean, I've got a master's degree. I've got a postgraduate, you know, diploma. Um, and now I'm working. So I think I'm in like my eighth year of post-secondary education now when you add them up. Um, and, and I don't say that to boast, I say that to uh, encourage people because all those programs, sorry, my heater just came on. I'm in my truck camper in Northern Alberta. Um, uh, education, I think, is, is a huge component of a successful post-Army career. Um, and again, I think a lot of uh, soldiers don't appreciate the fact that they've got the skills that can get them through. Uh, you know, Sherman mentioned <laughs> organization. I mean, it's so true. Um, if you're an organized person, you can do anything. Uh, yeah. So I'm sorry I didn't and I didn't give you what you wanted. Um, exactly what I was looking for. Yeah, whatever. Oh, but also, um, can 
you can can you put up my email to everybody and and if people are out there and if they have questions fire me an email and and i'll help you out like there are so many ex-servicemen that are out there also so you know karen to karen's wife or husband um there are people out there guys like me that have gone through it we've been there so don't uh ever think that that yeah there's vac and there's all that and that's great but there's also people out there and and, and i'll help anybody there you have it folks we've got three career development professionals budding career development professionals here <laughs> Given off all the good advice, I'll just step away now. You carry on, and <laughs> oh, you're all doing. But, but Paula, I just put it. I have to jump in because I just put in the chat. There's that camaraderie that everybody was talking about, right? There's that that brotherhood and sisterhood that we've got your back. That that is what I think. Um, is just so incredible about you know those that have served and just that. Like Martin, we're just we're not gonna just randomly put your email out to all of the people that are attending, you know, but just the offer that you would be willing to it just seems to me that that you don't you don't get that everywhere. And it just did, so. that, that, he did too. You know, you don't yeah, he did, he just put it in the chat. You just don't get that everywhere. And that that has such value, I think, to to other members that are that are are, are whether it's medically released or, or or some other form of release or retirement and it, it has and I don't know that we always see that elsewhere in you know in other careers with just that that coming together and that that willingness to just support each other I, I, I'm not sure that exists everywhere and yet it, it seems to me that it, ha it has such huge value um just just as just as humans, right? Just as humans on the planet together, it has huge value. But think about the value that that attitude has to civilian employers. Like you can't teach that. No, and they don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> so I just had to jump in because that just like Martin, that just seemed to me to be just symbolic of what we're talking about. So I appreciate that. Absolutely. It's always so interesting to me, you know, in the different, many different environments that I work and live and play in, people who have served can tell who other people that have served are. There's something about the way that you walk, the way that you talk, the way that you dress, the way that you act, people just know. And I see in the gym where I tend to spend a lot of time now, um, I see ex and currently serving members it's like oh you must be you must have been in the military like i hear them say this all the time and pretty soon there's you know six guys all standing together and chit chatting and sharing you know bro tips on how to do whatever exercise and where are you working and oh call my buddy joe you're looking for work it just seems to happen. And I don't see that happen anywhere else. Like, you know, I wouldn't meet Deirdre in the mall and be like, oh, she's clearly a career development person. Like I, you know, I should chat with her. <laughs> it's something that is very unique to the military. And I think to, you know, to, to fire and to police and, and um, paramedic as well. And it just really speaks to that, that connection and that, you know that kind of willingness to support and help one another so I, yeah very very cool <clears throat> i don't think we've got how much time do we have left i can't even see my clock at this point yeah we have about, we have about 15 minutes um left but i don't know if anybody's following the chat but we have several um viewers here joining us that are military or have released from the military and so you know there's um so for Karen and I can't Karen, I think you're monitoring the job, but Karen, Martin, and Sherman, like there, there are people here tonight that are just so resonating with your stories and so appreciative of not only your service, but coming here tonight and and kind of talking about and and, and sharing your experiences and lots of stuff that's being echoed and 
And um, so this this has really, I think, been a, um, an important conversation. And, and I'm so glad that we've we've had um, you know these attendees that are coming and and that you're here because there there's clearly you know important. This is clearly an important conversation that that needs to um, that needs to happen. And so I'm I'm very grateful for that. Awesome, awesome. Um, did we have any questions, Deirdre? Or should I carry on? And then if there's questions, we can get to them a little later. I think carry on. We've probably got like maybe you know five or six minutes more for for whatever you've got planned, um, Paula. And then um, everybody, if you've got any questions, then please don't hesitate. We'll we'll be wrapping up. You know, we've got like I say, we've got about fourteen or fifteen minutes left. So if you've got any questions, any things that or comments that that we can share with the panelists, then please don't hesitate to put them in the chat. Perfect. Great. Thank you for that. So the theme for Canada Career Month is it's possible. And um, one of the things that, you know, I have been thinking about around that theme is that I didn't know it was possible to leave my, my quote unquote normal job. My daughter always tells me to go and get a normal job because um, I have about five different jobs and two businesses and, and, you know, I do all of these things. I didn't think that it was possible to leave my normal job and be able to pursue all of the things that I'm interested in and make a living and have work-life balance doing all of that. When I finally took the plunge and made the decision to do that, I realized it was possible. It wasn't easy by any wild stretch, but it was absolutely possible. And so I'm curious to hear from each of you what your it's possible statement would be. What's something that you didn't ever think might be possible or an option for you or for your spouse or for a family member um, that through your transition you have discovered is possible. And I'd love for, love for to hear your it's possible statement. We'll start with, let's start with Sherman. His mic's off. So you, you're first up, sir. <laughs> oh, gee, thanks. Uh, yeah. Wow. What a, what a question. I think I'm going to have to say the transition for me, the what, what's possible is that <clears throat> I can put my family first. And you hit the nail right on the head when you talk about the work-life balance. Um, my career definitely wasn't balanced. It was always slanted towards work. Uh, where was the next operation? What was the next emergency? Where was the next fire in the world that needed to be put out? And how could I help be involved in that? Um, when I transitioned and became a public servant and, and that part of my life no longer came into play, um, I, I realized that the balance was, was not there um, and I had done it to myself. So now for me, what's possible is, is that I do get to put my family first. Uh, and, and my transition story is that my job is in Ottawa, but I live in Sarnia so that I can be close to as much of my family as I can. So I get to see my grandkids. Uh, I get to see some of my kids uh, because others are, are working in different parts of the world or different parts of the country. Um, and I get to spend time with them and not just once or twice a year. So that that's my what's possible. I love that. I love that. Your eyes sparkled when you talked about getting to be with your family. That's so awesome. <laughs> Awesome. Good. Great. Thank you, Sherman. All right, Martin, you're up. Um, I'm going to go a different direction and I'm going to say anything. I mean, if you look at me, I, I, and again, this is not to be boastful, but I, I think I am the poster child of what a, a former infantry paratrooper sergeant can do i mean i so i was in you know the military for 15 years i had 20 years in healthcare. uh i did i remember when i was a nurse in college uh i think it was first year i was you know looking out the window looking at the girls in the class i was 32 and i made three goals and goal number one was to be an er nurse uh Goal number two was to work as an outpost nurse up in the Arctic. And goal number three was an 
I remember the wording. I said, I'm going to end my healthcare career working for an INGO. Okay. So ER, yep, right out of school, right into the ER. Um, spent uh, a year, no, I spent about uh, five years in the ER. I worked EMS at the same time. So I was working in the street, working in Emerge, left those two jobs, went to critical care, did that for a year and a half. Then I thought that I had the skills uh, that I required and I went up north and I did outpost nursing, like, and not north. You know, you meet people from Alberta, they say, oh yeah, where do you work? North. And they say, oh, where's that Fort Mac? No, that's not north. Um, I worked up in, you know, Baffin Island, um, yeah, all the way across uh, to like the Northwest Territories. So I did that for three years. Uh, I, I came back, I worked public health for five minutes. Um, I got a, 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 you know, master's degree. I worked <laughs> emergency management was the best paying job with the best benefits, with the best boss in healthcare that I ever had. And then I quit that. I gave all that up to go to Africa and work for peanuts working in, you know, refugee camps. And I did that for five years. So you can do anything. Uh, and, and again, I'm not the smartest spark plug in the block. And if I can do this, anybody can do it. Oh, my career development heart is bursting. I love it. I love it. Anything is possible. I mean, you are all proof that anything is possible, right? Yeah. Aww. And I, and, and, and to Karen's husband and to everybody out there listening in like the panel, uh, that 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 are he are are hesitant to try something, just do it. Open that door and jump. Go for it, because you will succeed. The advice of a paratrooper: eh? <laughs> Open the door and just jump. jump. <laughs> Green light on and go. Trust your shoot. Just trust your shoot. <laughs> Awesome. That's awesome. Thank you very much, Martin. Karen, how about you? What's your it's possible statement as a military spouse, as somebody yeah. with the family history? Um, yeah, I can relate a lot to what Sherman said for when my dad transitioned. It was all about, I'm no longer taking postings. I'm no longer going on tour. I'm spending time with the, my family. For Ryan, I think it's more... Um, he can now take the time to heal first, heal himself first and close that chapter of his life um, and then start to look at what he wants to do. Um, Martin should be a motivational speaker. So that's next, Martin. Um, but definitely, you know, this is what he needs to hear. So more people transitioning needs to hear stuff like this um, to let them know that there are options and they are going to do well. Um, but that's the same advice I give is you just have to dive in, try it, you know, just try it. And then a big shout out to Brandon in the chat, because I also am a Nova Scotia girl. So uh, I don't blame you for wanting to move back there. <laughs> but yeah, anyway, that's, that's what I would say. Awesome. I love it. Wonderful words of advice, wonderful insights into what that transition has been like for each of you. And, you know, certainly similar similar stories but lots of different twists and turns along the way and I think you know one of the things that was kind of consistent through all of your stories is that you know you've got to have that that belief and that faith that you know things are going to work out you don't always know exactly what that well except for Martin exactly what the plan is going to look like <laughs> I was waiting to hear that you were going to date Sally the girl with blonde hair or something but there that didn't end up in your goal list so um no, but I did meet a beautiful Thai lady in you know, Cambodia, <laughs> and I married her. There you go. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, you know, so certainly, you know, being open and willing to hearing other people's experiences, other stories, being willing to try different things, um, you know, being willing to take, take that leap of faith, open the door and jump, <laughs> and know that whatever the next thing is, may not be the forever thing. And that is absolutely okay. <laughs> you know, so often people expect that, you know, I need to make 
the right decision. I need to pick the right job. I need to pick the right school. I need to pick the right program because this is my one chance to get it right. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, not, it's yeah. not. Yeah, but the pressure is, Paula, as you're talking about that, it reminds me of the, you know, the pressure we put on high school students when they're what, 15, 16. Tell us, cho choose now what you're going to want to do when you're 45. And as a career practitioner, I mean, it just, it breaks our heart, doesn't it? Because who knows? I mean, the amount of, um, and so I, I, I see the same thing happening with, with military as they're being released and thinking, you know, that pressure, if I, if I, I got to choose now, even though they might be healing, there might be lots of stuff that they have to do before they're even ready to choose. But that pressure to say, choose now, and this is, this is supposed to last you for the rest of your life. And Martin, I think that you have been an absolute brilliant example about how this is this is a journey. This is not a choose now and that's you're stuck with that forever. This is a exactly. choose what fits now. And then if it doesn't fit five, five years from now, choose again. There's nothing, nothing wrong yeah. about having multiple transitions in your life. You grow and change as a person. It makes yeah. sense that your career is going to evolve as well. So I like I think back to some of the things that I did, even even, even my army days, like I, I, I am so not that guy, you know, yeah. I, I can't believe that I used to jump out of planes at night <laughs> with 250 pounds strapped to me, you know, I mean, that's nuts. <laughs> but, but, and, 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 and even in, in Africa working in, you know, refugee camps, I mean, that's nuts, but uh, you know, you can do it. And, and, and anybody can do it. And, and, and again, I, I say this not to be boastful, but I, 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 I ex military people, they don't understand the skills and the yeah. experience that they have will last them a lifetime. You know, quick story. Uh, when I was working as a paramedic in uh, in uh, you know Calgary, one of the principles of leadership that I was taught was give praise when praise is due. One of the eight. Okay. When we used to go to calls, uh, whenever fire would show up, you know, fire and EMS, you know, kind of like oil and water. But I'd always say to the fire crews, I'd say, you know what? thanks for helping us lift the stretcher dudes and <laughs> no i i'm serious yeah. yeah and i i apologize to all the firefighters that may be out <laughs> in the audience you know but you could see it you could see like the next time that they showed up with us there'd be dude he'd be you know ready to help to help to lift the stretcher but it's the simplest little things that yeah ex-military people have that skill so yeah as colin knows in, in career services we often talk about those transferable skills or soft skills or employability skills like well, there's a million different names of them it seems to me that, that the, the the brilliance that military brings to civilian are all of those intangible things that that um employers desperately need but they don't necessarily want to train for because in some cases it's just how people are or how they you know some people call it common sense some people call it like there's a whole bunch of names we give to it but it's that it's that extra piece and to to me what part of the challenge is always is language like military speaks its own language and and so it really the bridge that has to be built this isn't a skill issue or a knowledge issue this is a language that we have to then, how do we equip our military members that are in transition to have the language around to demonstrate what they've done? Because, you know, you might not be able to get a job in the civilian labor market that requires you to jump out of an airplane with a 250 pound pack on your back in the middle of the night, in the middle of a desert. Like, but there is skill there and there is knowledge there that is incredibly important to almost any position in the civilian labor market. But it's just really helping that. Well, what what did I need to know in order to be able to do that? And what's the what are the words in this in the civilian labor market that will help me promote that? And, and it, it is a skill. It is like learning another language. And so we just have to provide those those supports. I'm oh, my God, we're getting all sorts of chats. I'm really um, 
the special piece Manette's the thing it's culture yeah the, it's a it's a culture isn't it? it it's a culture it's a community there's a language it's a family it's a, it's family. a family yeah right. absolutely so we we need to figure out how to um, like how to you, support those like in that sleep, transition like when you sleep with eight guys when you sleep with 30 guys <laughs> When you eat with eight or 30 guys, 120 guys, I mean, that's that's something that that doesn't exist in the civilian world very much. I'm sure it does somewhere, but um, but it is your family. You know what? Karen's right. And and, and family. Well, what's the saying? Friends are family that you choose. Right. Well, yeah. in the army, that's not necessarily so. It's the opposite. Friends are the idiots that they give you to work with you know <laughs> but then so, but then but, they become your family don't right, worry right? right they become your family then yeah, they yeah, become yeah. your family and then they're one of you and then they have your back and then you find out you know what you're not so much of an idiot after all right i mean it's it's just the way it is but uh uh, I, I can't stress it and i'm sorry for taking people's time no you're good you can do it not yeah you guys but the people that are out there right you can do it. You have the skills. You have the training. Uh, don't be afraid. Things will work out. Just do it. Yeah. That's, that's, thanks so much, Martin. This is Paula. Thank you for being such an incredible moderator. Sherman, thank you so much for being here and telling your story. Karen, we wish you and Ryan all of the best as you transition. <laughs> and, you know, you know, there, there are a million, there's so many people like Paula out there and, and including the people within the military that will be there to help Ryan. And of course you've got my number. Like, <laughs> and, and now you've got Martin's email too. And Martin, we really appreciate just, you know, um, this is, this has really meant a lot to, to me personally, to obviously the people that are in, that are, that are here uh, today. Uh, it's just, it, it's so important you know, you truly military service is giving your lives, right? It really is. And whether it's because you've taken your family all over the world or you haven't seen your families or, you know, you now have um, injury and illness to do, whatever it might be, um, you know, we are indebted to our military. And um, so then to me, I think that we have a moral responsibility to making sure that you're taken care of for, for life. And that's providing the kinds of transition services that you need in order to them you know, be successful in whatever success looks like for you, whether that's, you know, one, one job for the rest, or whether it's like Martin, who just seems to just kind of reinvent himself every few years, which is actually kind of cool. So I'm deeply grateful to all of you for being here. Um, Paula, Martin, Sherman, Karen, I, I'm so grateful for you. Um, and I'm so grateful for everybody that's been in the chat. There's been lots of conversation and there's been, there's somebody here that I think is working. I, I, I've lost track of the chat, but there's, there's some advice that's going on in the chat and, oh, somebody's serving, Jordan's serving in the Canadian Armed Forces Transition Group at, at oh, HQ. Jordan. So he's been offering some advice. So like, uh, do you know Jordan Paul? Yes. So I worked <laughs> with hilarious. <laughs> It really is a family, apparently. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad you're here, Jordan. <laughs> oh, that is so cool. That is so cool. So, like, you know, we, we apparently just had a, a little bit of a reunion. So that's, um, anyways, it is four minutes after. I think, Karen, it must be, is it nine o'clock for you? Yeah, nine o'clock for Karen. So Karen's got to go to bed. Yeah, it's pretty dark. <laughs> it, it's time. So, again, my, my deepest... Um, Deepest, deepest appreciation for you all being here tonight. Thank you so much for your service to all of our attendees that are also serving. We have somebody from the Israeli Defense Force that's here. So it doesn't matter. We thank you for your service. Um, all, the, all the best for Remembrance Day tomorrow. It's actually a statutory holiday here in, in British Columbia. It's not in Ontario, which always makes me wonder. Um, Paula, is it a stat holiday in, in Alberta? Yeah, come on. It is in New Brunswick. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Ontario, you got to get it together. Sherman, see if you can fix that while you're... <laughs> I'll see what I can do. Add it to your list. All right, my friends, thank you so much. Again, I am so grateful for your service. I'm so grateful for you being here tonight and just having some really important conversations. I think these, these conversations need to happen. 
our military need to feel that they have a voice, that they have opportunities. And Man Alive, the civilian workforce, we need you guys. And so um, we desperately need you. We desperately need you. It, the labor market needs you. Um, enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you so much again. Uh, we will end up being posting this on, on, uh, on YouTube. So if you want to watch us again, you can. But in the meantime, thank you so very much. It was a, a, my sincere pleasure. Take Thank good you. care, everybody. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye now. Bye. Bye.